Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the part of the world. Welcome to Delving Deep, another episode or segment brought to you by the USA, uh, USA Youth of the National Diocese. And on this segment, for this episode, we are going to be bringing to you a topic that is called, Can I Make the Tax Rule Work for Me? And for today, we have a special guest that will definitely enlighten us on how to make uh, this tax season, how we can get the most return from our taxes. And this individual is an outstanding individual that has a resume that is uh, to be uh, a resume that probably cannot be compared with. But uh, as you all know, uh, as our regular, as our regular, as our regular routine, uh, let's go ahead, bow our heads for prayer before we begin. Let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer. Jehovah, Jesus Christ, Holy Michael, Lord of Lord, King of King, eternal rock of ages. For that, Lord Jesus, we thank you for preserving us for this day. We thank you for giving us the grace to be able to give your people another enlightenment regarding tax and regarding financial literacy, O oh Lord. For that, Lord Jesus, let your Holy Spirit descend amidst us in the mighty name of Jesus, the individual that you will be using. Father, Lord Jesus, take over his soul, take over his body, and let the spirit and the thing that is going to teach us let, us, let us be to our benefit in the mighty name of Jesus. We have prayed. Amen, 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 in Jesus' name. Seven hallelujah to praise God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Once again, I will be your anchor for today's segment, and my name is Brother Olufemi. And we are bringing to you another great episode, just like I mentioned earlier. Since this is the tax season, uh, we thought it would be beneficial for us to bring you uh, a professional that is definitely a certified expert when it comes to filing your taxes and making the most of your money. Um, the individual that I'm gonna be bringing to you, his name is Terry, and this special gentleman, has 35 years of experience in accounting and financing, as well as leading a IT team to align with technology to strategic objectives. Uh, this honorable gentleman also has a Bachelor of Science in Business from Indiana University and is also a licensed CPA, CGMA, and also CITP. But later on, for you guys that are wondering what all those letters mean, I'm pretty sure it's going to give us exactly what those letter means uh, once uh, once I actually tell him to formally introduce himself. Also, uh, this gentleman in his spare time as a hobby enjoys the great outdoors uh, with family and friends and is also uh, a, an enthusiast for a big kayak angler. You have to explain what that means, sir. I know of kayaking, but kayak angler, I haven't heard that term, sir. So once again, um, be so that we can get everything rolling. Uh, please uh, let me introduce our guest that I've just named all his credentials to the best of my ability, Mr. Terry. Can you please uh, come on the line? First of all, can you please just give uh, an introduction to yourself, to all our viewers in the world, uh, before you actually provide us with the ed educational uh, outline and things that you want to present to us today, sir. Thank you, Shepherd in Christ. It is an honor and a privilege to be here today. And uh, all those fancy letters at the end of my name really don't mean anything if I don't provide any value to you. <laughs> so, so real quick, uh, the CPA is a certified public accountant. Uh, the CGMA is a certified global management accountant. And mm. the CITP is a certified information technology professional. Oh, outstanding, outstanding. Those are those are very much great things. Okay, so go ahead and um, let the world know exactly. Um, I mean, just like I just like I've explained to the world, you've been in this business when it comes to the accounting and the tax arena for over close to thirty five years of experience. So, uh, so without no the further ado, uh, to all our guests at home, I know it's the tax season. So please, if you know that you are receiving some kind of you are getting federal tax deducted, state taxes deducted. You have a personal business, whatever it is. Now is the best time. If you have not filed your taxes, now is the best time to get out a notepad, a pen, jot down as much information 
as you can. As you all know, this type of educational finance uh, briefing, usually most people usually pay for it. So, sir, the floor is all yours. Give us. Uh, so let's try to dig into everything, <laughs> everything that you have to offer, us, sir. Thank you, Shepard and Price. Um, so can I make the tax world's tax um, rules work for me? Absolutely. But it's complicated. And let me tell you, there is a lot of dollars going into the federal government of the United States. Last year, there were $4.1 trillion that were collected in taxes by over 261 million tax returns that were filed. So that's a lot of money that's being taken from us. And so what we want to do is pay our fair share, but not a penny more. And that's what we're going to talk about today is to say, how can we find some opportunities to reduce our tax liability? And I want to start out with a couple of examples that I hope some of you can relate to. And we're going to start with an individual that is, um, his name is John and he's 23 years old and he is uh, graduated college and he's just starting out. He makes $30,000 in uh, income and he rooms with a friend and uh, he saves uh, about $1,300 a month for uh, expenses and living expenses. And uh, he has a 401k plan and we're going to put together and see what he does with his money to get him a zero tax liability for federal purposes. He has a $30,000 salary. He takes his maximum 401k contribution from his employer. And if you're, if you work for a nonprofit, it would be a 403b opportunity for you to take, take some, uh, retirement savings and put that into those uh, plans that are nonprofits uh, for those 403B. So when I say 401K, it also 403Bs are very similar if you're familiar with that term. So he took out 12,000 in 401K deductions and that led him with 18,000 in gross income. He takes a standard deduction that he can take of $12,950. That leaves a taxable income of $5,000. So his federal tax is 500, but because he contributed, and this is key for this year, it's called a saver's tax credit, which means if you take out an IRA or you participate in your employer's 401k, you also get an additional savings credit. And so in his case, he would get a that $500 and five, uh, $505 credit to his federal tax, which means he would have zero federal tax at the end of the year because he was able to contribute a lot to his employer plan and with the deductions get that credit. So that's, that's the way somebody that's single uh, in there, you know, making uh, around 30 to $40,000, you just contribute the max to your plan take the credits, and then you have no federal taxable income. Let's move to scenario number two. And they're the Smiths. They're a married couple and they have two children. Uh, the Smiths put a strong emphasis on savings. So they take their maximum 401k and they, they also uh, take out a traditional IRA. You can take both of those. So some people think you can only take one or the other. You can take your employer 401k or 403b, and you can also take a traditional IRA. So they take those, their two children go to elementary school and they pay for after school care. And uh, that total care amounted to $5,000. So they contribute that $5,000 to their child care flexible spending account. So if you have children, one opportunity the government provides you is to set up a child care flexible spending account. And so all that money that you pay for anyway to uh, different people to help you take care of your children, uh, you can take that as a tax deduction. So that's important to know. So 
this married couple, their annual salary was $104,000. And we're going to get them to a zero federal tax income. Their salary was $104,000. They took out their max on their 401k each for a total of $41,000. They also took out a traditional IRA each. And that was another $12,000 of deductions. They also have a healthcare flexible spending account, which uh, makes sure that you qualify with a qualified account, but your healthcare uh, spending can be deducted uh, when you run it through a healthcare spendable account. They ran it through for $2,750. They had the $5,000 childcare uh, account in their spending account that they got credit for that gave them an adjusted gross income from 104 down to $43,000. They received a $25,000 standard deduction. They weren't able to itemize. You're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about, is it better to itemize or have standard deductions? Well, it depends on, on how much you have in itemized deductions, but their taxable income was 17,000 from all of that. So that meant their federal taxes were 17,000, I mean, sorry, $1,765. They took another child independent care credit, which is another credit in addition to the child care flexible spending credit. This is uh, another credit per child. They took, they had two children. So it's $1,565. And um, they also have a refundable child credit in addition to that for 2,435. So they actually had a refund of $2,435 as a result. So they did not pay a single dollar in federal tax because they maximized all of these different uh, vehicles for their credits on their off of their taxes. And this last scenario I'm going to give you is, um, uh, a married couple, the Jacksons, they are 55 years old and they are empty nesters. They don't have any more children living with them. So they're looking forward to retirement. Um, they have an annual salary together of $113,000 and they still make 401 co contributions and max that out. They also max out their traditional IRAs. But in addition to that, because they're over 50, you get additional credit that you can take and contribute into your retirement accounts. And so, um, but they also have a, a few investments in stocks. And so they select some of their stocks that were losing money. And so they took a $3,000 loss uh, from their stocks that they've sold uh, for a tax advantage. They made a health savings account contribution of $8,300. That gave them a gross income of $34,000. Then they took a standard deduction of $25,000. That left them with a taxable income of $8,550. Their federal tax was $855. And because they saved for their retirement, they got a, receive, a retirement savings credit equal to uh, the amount of federal taxes they owed of $855, leaving them with a tax bill of $0. So the reason I just throw these three uh, scenarios up is you can be single, you can be married with children, and you can be a retired couple uh, nearing retirement. And there's still ways to use the tax, what the, federal government gives you for tax exempt incentives through tax credits, through saving and through your child cares, through your health care uh, to get those tax liabilities way down. So that's just a little bit of overview. We're going to uh, jump into some more specifics, but I just thought felt like giving stories for you to hear real life situations that can it, can I do that? But what it does is it requires a sacrifice of investing in the future and foregoing some of the niceties you might want now. You might want a new car or, um, you know, new clothes, new jewelry. Um, but 
you know, if you want to sacrifice and invest some of that more for retirement, the government will reward you for that, for saving. And so that's, I think that's important to know as we move into this. Um, so today we're going to cover uh, on our agenda uh, a couple of different things. Um, we're going to cover the um, tax considerations for W-2 employees. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, those people who uh, have W-2 wages for a living. Then we're going to look at some people that are self-employed and, and what are some of the things they can do. And then we'll look at business owners that have employees. What are some of the tax uh, deductions that um, we can consider for them? And then some benefits of filing uh, for a nonprofit. What, what can nonprofits benefit from uh, uh, for federal tax purposes and why would you do that? Um, and then we'll open it up at the end for some questions uh, and answers. Uh, so I think it's important to understand um, the government wants to incentivize certain things. And so, depending upon where and who you are and how you do business and bring in your income can drastically impact what your tax rates are. So we've just talked about all the situations I mentioned to you were employees that had a W-2 wages. Um, they didn't have a lot of wealth. As you can see, they were, they were saving all that they could for future retirement. And there wasn't a whole lot of extra spending that they had available. And that's this quadrant of being an employee um, where you have about 5% wealth. And this, by the way, this is from uh, Robert uh, Kiyosaki, um, Rich Dad Cash Flow Quadrant. Um, if you've never uh, heard about Robert Kiyosaki or his book, uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad, or this Rich Dad Cash Flow Quadrant, um, I would uh, recommend uh, you picking that up or renting that uh, from Amazon, um, Kindle Books, if you got a friend that has it. But it really does a good job explaining um, what are the opportunities uh, for my lifestyle and how it impacts uh, from the tax uh, aspect and how the government looks at that. So you have the fewest deductions when you're uh, you know, a, an employee. Uh, basically, the deductions we talked about mainly were tax credits from savings and incentives. The next level, um, if you want to move down, think of this quandary of going from an employee to let's say that you you branch out on your own and you become self-employed uh, or that you're a doctor or an accountant or you're a professional uh, and you're self-employed and you, you own your own job. Um, basically, uh, you derive almost all of your income from the services you provide. Uh, and what the government does there is you're taking a greater risk out there and they do give you some uh, additional tax um, write-offs to consider. Um, and we'll get into that. And if, as you, as you start to grow and, and want to move toward building wealth, um, that's when you move out of a self-employed mindset and you moved into a business owner mindset. And he, that'll even give you more deductions, uh, more opportunities for that. And with that, you'll be able to grow wealth through um your staff and your team and other people helping you with your uh, business objectives and goals. Uh, and of course, they're a great, uh, while they produce income for you, they're also a great tax write off through wages and benefits and all those other things. And so that gives you uh, a way to grow, but yet uh, leverage, leverage your wealth um, with that. And then the last group, yeah, after a business owner, um, if you can get into becoming an investor and have everybody else work for you, um, that would be the ultimate in wealth accumulation. And that's the most tax favored status in a lot of instruments that investors have. 
through real estate investments have a high degree of depreciation, even though they cash flow, they have book loss and, and tax loss. So that drives tax liabilities down. And they also invest in other investments uh, with capital. And currently in our current environment, we still have favorable capital gains rates of zero to 15 to 20%. Um, and so those are very, very, um, uh, attractive, you know, attractive for uh, investors to want to invest and, and work through uh, those types of vehicles. And you also have laws for the conversion of some of those uh, investments for other similar investments through tax free exchanges. And so that's another way to sell um, your property, for example, your real estate and still gain an advantage. Uh, and not have to pay tax on that. So those laws are set up for uh, encouraging investing, creating jobs. That's what the government wants you to do is build capital um, and, and create jobs. So with that, let's dive into um, Oh, I'm sorry. I just realized I apologize. Uh, the slide I was on and looking at wasn't, one that you were displayed. So um, real quickly, this is what I was just talking to you about being a, uh, an employee with that job, a self-employed individual, um, moving to a business owner, uh, creating more jobs and then becoming an investor. And so I, I apologize for not having that slide up while I was talking about that, but hopefully that gives you a visual representation of what I was talking about. Now let's dive into some more specifics. And with that, uh, we want to look at uh, our W-2, going back to our W-2 earners um, and look at the opportunities that they have. The first thing is important if you're a W-2 uh, to make sure that you're taking out the proper amount of taxes. And that's done on your W-4 forms. Uh, where you say how many exemptions that you want to have, because if you don't take out enough, um, if, you, if you take out too many deductions and you take out too, too little of withholding through the year, at the end of the year, when you're ready to pay, you will be surprised and have to owe taxes because you did not withhold enough. And that's, that's up to you as an employee responsibility to make sure your W-4 forms are filled out correctly and that you're taking out and holding the right amount of tax so that you don't get hit with a tax burden at the end. Uh, we've talked about the tax advantaged accounts. Those are your 401ks, your 403bs and your IRAs. And those, as, I've, as we've seen, as I've sh shared with you, is a way that you can dramatically reduce your income tax. Also the child uh, credits, the other tax credits, earned income credits, um, the medical savings uh, credits. Uh, those are other ways to reduce your taxable income uh, for W-2 uh, wage earners. With the itemized deductions, uh, you can look at your standard deductions and then if your itemized deductions are greater than your standard deductions, especially this happens when you're a big giver at church and, and you give a lot of your income to the church. Um, that's a situation where it may be your, your, your itemized deductions could be greater than your standard deduction. So you want to look at both of those and add those up and make sure uh, that you're taking the, the greater amount. And importantly, in all of that is keeping good records. Uh, if the IRS comes and audits you and you can't substantiate uh, an expense or a credit that you've taken, then they're just, they're not going to let you have that. They're going to, they're going to add that back to your income and you'll have to pay taxes and penalties. So it's very important to always keep accurate uh, records of, of what you've got. Um, and one thing I want to note about those credits that I think it's important um, in 2021 versus 2022, the uh, child tax credit is $1,600 less than it was last year. 
for 2022. The uh, earned income credit is $1,000 less than it was last year. And the child independent care credit is $5,900 less than it was last year. It was 8,000 in 2021. It's now only $2,100. So, you know, you total those up and that's, that's uh, almost $9,000 of credits that they've reduced uh, from 2021 because of the, you know, pairing back from the COVID relief. So it's also important to take that into mind. If you've been counting on those credits uh, for your taxes, um, there'll be substantial um, add back to your income because these deductions are so, uh, are a lot less. So it's very important for you to kind of track what those changes in those credits are and how it's going to impact your income. Now let's move on to the self-employed uh, individual who's uh, basically they're their own, uh, you know, they're their own, uh, source of income. They're a professional uh, services, uh, creative services, um, writers, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, accountants, um, uh, handyman, uh, many people that are self-starters that uh, do this. Uh, you know, they are self-employed and they'll get a 1099 or if they're incorporated, they may get a K-1 um, uh, or a, um, uh, yeah, a, a K1, uh, in addition, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but these are more for just the self-employed to get 1099s. What do these group of people need to, uh, consider, uh, to lower their, uh, expenses, uh, for income taxes? Uh, again, it's, it's even more important, I think, here for those individuals to keep accurate records because now you get to deduct travel expenses, you get to deduct uh, meals for business purposes, and any other expenses that are reasonable uh, and ordinary in, in your business are eligible for deduction. So that's kind of the general rule. If you follow that, then, then those deductions will be uh, acceptable. What would be unreasonable? Let's say that um, nor ordinarily you would, let's say you're traveling and you stay uh, in a city and the hotels on average run $150. Um, but you stay at the, a luxury hotel for $2,500 a night. Uh, that would be considered unreasonable uh, for the type of, trip that you would be taking. So that's kind of a guideline on how make sure it's reasonable and, and it's appropriate and you'll be okay. Um, again, uh, more and more expenses you're able to deduct as you own your own business, you can deduct equipment and supplies, um, home office expenses. If that home office is dedicated space for your, you to do your work, um, and that can be a $5 square foot up to 400 square feet um, deduction or actual expenses if that turns out to be more. Uh, and anything you supply in that space is deducted, whether it be office supplies, desks, uh, shelving, uh, furniture, uh, even painting, painting the walls uh, is deductible if it's for that specific room. Um, and you can, as a self-employed person, you can also set up your own 401k called a solo 401k and get the same benefits or a, a self-employee pension plan. Um, the other one is you can consider contributing to a health savings account. But again, um, if you find that insurance company, that, that account has to qualify as an HSA qualified account. For you to set one up and get it uh, get it counted for you. So those so those are some uh, as you can see you get you get more freedom to have more expenses deducted from your income uh, for uh, a self employed individual. And so moving on to a business owner.
Now, if you're a business owner um, and let's say that you've decided to um, own your own business and uh, it's an LLC, you, you, you formed a limited liability company or an S company or even a C corp company, uh, those three types of companies, uh, you even get more deductions uh, related to business. And you, again, um, you know, accurate uh, record keeping is very key. Um, make sure that um, very similar to the 1099, all business related expenses, equipment, supplies, software, computer equipment, your phones, all of that is uh, eligible for deductions. Um, if you're renting a space, um, you're able to take the rent for that. Um, if you're upfitting it, you have deductions for the upfit and many of those deductions can qualify for immediate expense through a section called section 179 in depreciation. You can write that off all at once. If it's a roof, it's an air conditioner you're fixing, if it's um, electrical. Um, so those types of things are eligible for direct write-offs up to a million plus dollars. Um, the same thing, uh, in this is you can set up a SEP IRA, a 401k. Um, now you have work opportunity tax credits, uh, research and development tax credits. So there's a, there's a growing array of credits that are available um, as you own a business. Um, and structuring that business is very, very important that you understand what the advantages are for each one. Uh, of course, each one gives you some liability uh, shield from, uh, you know, your work and, um, that's important, but another key tax savings, uh, that that's employed here. Well, I, and I forgot we could, you can also um, hire your children if you own a business and that's, uh, and, and that's, uh, another thing that you can pay them, uh, W2 wage up to 16, a little bit, almost $17,000. And um, another uh, tax savings idea, even, even if you pay them that money, if you take that money uh, and let's say at least um, $5,000 and put that in their, uh, their individual IRA account and do that for a couple of years, in 30 years, they'll be a millionaire. So that's another a way to, to have, and they don't have to pay income tax on that. Uh, so you're getting the deduction as a business owner and they don't have to pay that income tax as uh, a W-2 employee uh, child. And the child has to be uh, at least eight years old um, to qualify. But so it is important how to structure that. If you decide to go with an S corporation or an LLC taxed as an S corporation, uh, then you get into reasonable compensation that you can pay yourself and then all the other earnings from your business is not subject to self-employment tax, which would be 15 over 15.3%. Um, and so that's really a get big key tax planning uh, idea as well is at what point would it be beneficial to, to set up your company as an S corporation even if you're the only employee, you can do that. I do that personally for myself. I set up as an S corporate uh, LLC taxed as an S corporation. So those are some uh, ideas in business and moving on to, and I know we're moving fast. And I apologize. There's so much to cover. Um, and we want to get, we want to get to everything that uh, uh, Kareem has asked me to cover. So <laughs> it's a lot, it's a lot to cover in a short period of time. Um, the next one that we're going to talk about is um, nonprofit tax savings ideas. And, you know, why would you, why would you elect a nonprofit? Well, if you're trying to do something for the betterment of the social good and, and you're organizing to do that, uh, even if you're, bringing in volunteers and you're maybe even paying some people to be on staff. Um, forming as a 990 uh, tax exempt organization, 
you you're excluded from income tax for your primary activities and your tax exempt purposes. Now you can also, um, I've got some nonprofits that are a little confused on, um, well, do they ever have to pay tax? And that answer is yes. If, if you are, let's say that you want to create a supporting activity, that generates some profit to help support the organization. Then you could form, uh, I mean, then you would report that just that activity as taxable income through what's called a 990 T form. It's you're the same organization, but you can operate some for-profit activity and there's rules and regulations to how much you can do and limit. But, um, but you're able to do that and a kind of a rule of thumb is don't do any more than 20% of revenues related to your taxable uh, endeavor to support your uh, tax exempt organization uh, as a kind of a general rule of thumb. But definitely check um, more specifically with your activities and, and with your local CPAs and tax attorneys to help you out. So, tax savings ideas. First thing is keep your tax exempt status current. There's, there were over 1.3 million nonprofits that failed to file their tax returns and lost their tax exempt status. So it's really important to maintain uh, your tax exemption by filing your tax returns every year. Um, it also gives you transparency and accountability to uh, other stakeholders, including your donors and your members and keeping them abreast to what's going on with your organization. It also attracts other donors by filing your taxes. So in a way it's a revenue generator. If you're transparent and you show people what you're doing and don't hide anything, then they're more willing to, to give. And so that's actually a, a way to, to generate more donors and, and, and more funding. Um, and that also opens it up to more government grants and funds. Um, if that's what, if that's what you want to do, um, I know that a lot of non, uh, I mean, a lot of religious organizations prefer not to get involved in, uh, you know, government sponsored grants or funding. And so I want to be sensitive to that, but it does provide some of those, uh, more activities, uh, for grants and funding to happen from the public as you open up and file your 990s. Um, it also ensures uh, that you're in compliance with laws, regulations and reporting requirements uh, because they're very strict and uh, it gives your donors that vote of confidence that you're doing things uh, right. And so I think that's really important. And then, um, you know, preparing your taxes means you have to put your financials together. So that's another way to help you with budgeting and planning and decision making to make sure that uh, your organization has enough funding to do what you're trying to do with the mission that, that God has called you to do. So it's really important piece of that. And that helps uh, by filing that tax return as well as make sure all of that is in order. So, um, So great. Now that you've taken all these tax savings ideas, right. And, and I'm, I hope you're a fast rider. I know we've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time, but one thing that I think is really important for, um, you know, taxpayers to really take advantage of is when they get refunds, it's just a natural human nature response to just want to go spend it because it's like, I just got this money and I want to go spend it. Um, but I'm going to recommend a couple of different um, alternatives to just spending your money uh, that will benefit you for years to come. Um, if you just make it a habit um, and, and I'm not saying take all of it to do that. Um, but but consider these and, and they will definitely uh, you will think your older self will thank your younger self for making the decision to do it. Um, one main one is emergency funds. Uh, the majority of 
people in this country, and I'm, I'm sure many other countries, um, don't have, can't even, 85% of families in this country can't make it week to week. And if they had a $400 repair, they, they wouldn't be able to, to make it. So building up an emergency fund, it gives you a peace of mind and financial security. So set aside that tax refund in a savings account or a money market fund um, if you don't have an emergency fund. And I've had people come to me and say, oh, I want to invest in this or this and this. And I, I asked them, do you have an emergency fund set up? And they're like, no, but we want to invest this money and get the biggest return for, for what we can get. And I said, but can you afford to lose that? Because if you, if you can't afford to lose it, that means you need to have more in your emergency fund because the emergency fund does give you that peace of mind. And the recommendation is up to six months of your, of your salary in an emergency fund. So if that happens, you're protected um, and you're not trying to figure out how your family is going to eat tomorrow. Um, so that's really important that that's, that's a big way that, that the majority of people can, can really take that tax refund and build, start building an emergency fund if they don't have one or add to it so that it's sufficient. Uh, they can consider um, turning right around and contributing more if they didn't max out their 401ks or the 403bs. That's another way for them to, to contribute even more. And if you, so t here's a tax uh, planning idea. If you have not contributed to an IRA or 401k or maxed them out, you have till uh, April 18th to make those additional contributions and they will count back to um, uh, 2021. And so um, now I should say on the 401, the, the spot, the employee 401ks, I should let's take a step back. Those were done in 12-31-22 uh, because um, once that happens, your 401ks are done for the year and they roll over. But your individual IRAs, um, you're able to contribute um, up until mm -hmm. April 18th and, and your IRAs will count toward 2021 for another tax savings idea. Um, an investment account. So if you've covered your emergency fund and your retirement accounts, then you can start considering investment accounts, mutual funds. Um, uh, there's a organization called Betterment that, um, that does um, robo funds, robo investing, and it's, uh, they follow the standard and poor's index. Uh, so more index funds, if you don't want to get uh, risk too risky, um, you can do high yield savings accounts, certificates of deposit. Uh, you can always invest in real estate or you can pay off debt. So those are, those are some uh, really good ways to consider what you would do with your tax, tax refund. And um, so just things to think about. And so just to summarize, Um, so what do we do? So W2 employees, make sure you have the correct income tax withheld, participate in your company's tax advantaged accounts like your 401k and 43B. Um, make sure that you claim all your eligible income tax credits, child credits, and also compare your itemized deductions to your standard deduction to see if your itemized is greater than take that. Don't just take your standard deduction without making that calculation and keep accurate records. If you're self-employed, um, boy, really keep, keep those accurate records. Uh, make sure you account for all of your eligible business expenses. They're ordinary and customary. You're, you're able to deduct those. So deduct every dollar and penny that you have. Um, now remember you have estimated tax payments. If you don't, if you don't have, if you're not an employee of like your sub S and you're, and you've got 1099s every quarter, you must pay in estimated tax payments. So you don't have any underpayment penalties, which could be two to 3% of the entire amount. So we didn't cover that before. 
um, setting up a retirement plan, of course, and using tax advantage accounts as a self-employed. As a business owner, uh, again, keeping records is paramount. Uh, even have more eligible business expenses and business tax credits come into play, depreciation. Um, you still also have the tax advantage accounts, retirement accounts, and tax credits and eligible business structures to be more creative with tax savings. And then the benefits of the nonprofits, maintaining your tax exempt status is critical, transparency, accountability, attracting donors, um, increasing the opportunity for government grants and compliance with tax uh, laws and regulations uh, and financial uh, decision making. And then finally, uh, Kareem wanted me to cover. Boy, Terry, that sounds really, really complex. Um, but it could be really, really simple. As we saw in the W-2s, if you, if you just participate and max out your 401ks with your employer and then take the credits the government already gives you, uh, even if you just take the standard deductions, it, that's a pretty simple way to go about it. And you can have zero tax liability. So it's, it could be complicated, but sometimes not. Um, but if it is complex, that's when you should consider a CPA. If you have multiple sources of income, investments, rental property, um, being self-employed, you know, a CPA can help navigate those complexities for you uh, because we know the tax codes, we know how they can work for your advantage. Um, another one is if you just want a higher level of accuracy and attention to detail and just know you've got everything right um, and that the errors, um, uh, you know, that you're, reduce those risk of errors as a, in a result of an audit and a fine. Nobody wants to be audited. And if they do, they want to be protected. And so a CPA can help bring that peace of mind. And then, um, you know, preparing tax returns can be time consuming. So if you just want to save some time, um, especially if you have a, you know, complex tax situation then hiring that CPA can save you that time and effort. But I will be quite honest with you on a lot of these um, tax um, preparation software. Artificial intelligence has come so far that they do a phenomenal job to handle the ordinary, normal filings of W-2s and general expenses. They they do a great job of walking you through. Um, you know, if you feel confident to do that, I would not spend the extra money on a CPA to do that because they've, they've gotten so good. Um, so I do want to uh, mention that as well. And you always have your HR block uh, and your other types of um, agencies that have been around for years and years that that that's all they do. And so that's another source of tax preparation to consider as well uh, are those. And now I know it's, I've fed, I feel like I've fed you a fire hose of information and it's all swimming around in your minds. Um, and I know we've reached the end of our time and we're a little over, but I do want to open it up for a, a few minutes of questions and answers um, and, and see if we can, if we can answer some, some of those. Thank you very much. As you can see, um, uh, Mr. Terry has definitely uh, given us a water hose to where like we've just been waterboarded with a whole lot of information regarding taxes, being that is the tax season. Uh, once again, Mr. Terry, I want to say thank you very much for that outstanding presentation. And also thanks to Mr. Kareem that you keep mentioning about. Totally appreciate it. So to all our viewers out there that are home, uh, I already see... Uh, some people asking questions and the questions we definitely will be populated. If you have most questions, just keep keep on coming so that because this is like the opportunity and the forum to where you can get that question answered from a certified professional that has been in this business or in this arena for the past 35 years. So the first question, uh, Mr. Terry, that I want to address 
which is uh, from one of our viewers, was that how do they know the amount of taxes to withhold from the W-2? And what is, and they said, is there a rule of thumb for this? Yes, again, we go back to um, when you're employed in the United States, um, you're going to pay tax for that work you're doing in the U.S. And so the employers are obligated to give you a W-4 form when you start out to work. And that's why it's important to fill out that form as accurately as you can with the number of exemptions because it, it's going to key out the number of exemptions that you claim. So you claim yourself as an exemption, claim your wife, if you have kids, you can claim each of those. But the more exemptions you claim, the less tax they withhold. Okay. So it's important that you understand that, that especially students understand if they're claiming, um, you know, if you want to be conservative, um, either claim one or zero exemption and you should be, okay, that should be enough to with the government to withhold that. So you don't have tax liability at the end of the year. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Um, also, uh, the other question is, can a 1099 and a W-2 be filed together? Okay. The answer to that is they're going to be shown differently in your tax return. Mm. Okay. So the way that happens is your W-2 wages are going to appear on your front of your form 1040 on your front page under wages. Yes, sir. Okay. Now the 1099s are going to come in on your schedule C. You're going to file mm. another schedule and to say, I've got earnings from my 1099 on this business. And then you file that income from your 1099 on your schedule C in any business related expenses. And then that yes, income comes over to the front of the 1040. So that's gotcha, how, sir. so that's how the 1099 and the W2 they're in different places, but then they come back all on the front form at the end to say, here's my W-2 wages and here were my business income from my 1099. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, also, hey, guys, uh, for to all our viewers out there, keep the question going, um, especially for those that are new to the uh, to the filing of taxes arena. And um uh, and me as the oster, I actually have, uh, I actually wrote down a couple of questions um, in regarding to atomization. When you were talking about at atomization, I know within the re religious arena, um, to be to be quite frank and just to be to be for transparency purposes, when it comes to church, some people pay tithes, which tithes to some is a donation. Now, how can people atomize such to be able to claim it on their taxes? Because I know some such as some um, some uh, some religious establishment do that by providing the members with the paperwork that they can take along with their tax uh, with their tax document to where they can file it. Can you please elaborate more on that for for all our viewers that are home, sir? Sure, you're. Um, your gifts and your tithes and your offerings um, are, especially if they go to, it's got to be a tax exempt organization that is filed under any of the 501c3 organizations or other 501c organizations that mm. qualify. So as long as your church is a qualified 501c3, because that would be, in this case, it's a religious organization. So it would be a 501c3. Yes, and they have, a, they have their certificates, right, from the government that say you are tax exempt. Then you can take that deduction and your church is required to write you a receipt at the end of the year to say you gave the church this much money and that you have to have that written documentation Again, remember when I said is to have everything backed up, you have to have that in backed up with a receipt from the church that says this is how much you gave to the church and you're able to deduct that and have 
full conscience that it's all it's all good. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for that explanation. For those uh, for those that are with a religious establishment such as churches, uh, key word, key things that um, uh, our guest speaker just mentioned. Your church has to be registered under a five hundred one c. I can't remember exactly which C it is, but it has to be under a nonprofit, uh, I guess, arena for you to be able to even come close to trying to file that or get those um, get those uh, itemization from the church that you attend. Sir, I also have another question. I think uh, I'm not sure whether I wrote this right. Uh, it's regarding the, the nonprofit arena also. When it comes to a religious organization that filed the 990. Now I know for most of the establishments and stuff like that, uh, to my to my to my knowledge, most of them do fall on the 501c. But once this establishment filed their taxes uh, and they are part of just like you just just like you mentioned, they have to file the taxes every year to where they are. Um, they can they can qualify for that not exempt arena just like you mentioned is that right sir that is correct they they have they have to file their 990s every year or they're going to be revoked and okay, once thank you very much revoked thank you very much now once this is filed for some churches um how can they uh be able to discover or research uh certain grants certain fundings that the federal government or that the state has available for religious establishment to where they also can compete with other uh, with other churches to be able to qualify for this grant. Is there like a certain procedure since we're talking about taxes and the financial realm? Is there a certain way that it can go about finding out this research, putting in the grants, how the grants needs to be written up and the whole nine yards, sir? Yeah, I'll give one specific example that I was part of, and this was we um, we were building a, a youth facility in a um, area that was um, in poverty. Mm. OK, and so what we did was we were able to get um, a sponsorship by the federal government called the New Market Tax Credit. And that's that was simply a way for um and, and there's only about 40 new market tax credit organizations that work with the governments but we applied and what we received it was a 20 million dollar project and we received 25 percent tax credit for that project mm. because because we were uh tax exempt and we were doing it in a economically depressed uh, zip code. It had to be yes, in, a, in a market that qualified. Um, but, but that, so those types of opportunities are available. So I would encourage any nonprofit that's, that's looking to invest in any type of capital project in any areas that, that are um, under the poverty level, um, to try to seek out a new market tax credit company and see if you can get some tax credit, I mean, get some qualify for that support. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, also one of our viewers, uh, just put in a question and the question that, pre that presented to you, sir, is how does an employee start a family members employee on a W2? I'm not sure if that question is, uh, is comprehensible to you, sir. Because I think the way it came out of my mouth, I kind of got flustered a little bit. No, I I understand how that would work. Is you have to you have to set up the um, you have to set up the um, business so that you're able to employ W two wages. So if you're just a sole proprietor, you can't do that, right? You're mm. right. You, you're Schedule C. You, you're not an employer. You have to have an employment number. So number. in my case, you know, that's why I, I have a sub S corp. I mean, a limited liability company taxed as a sub S. Um, I'm my own employee, but I could hire other employees. So I, as a sub S owner, I can hire my children uh, if they were of age. They're not 
they're not that young anymore. <laughs> they were. And, and the kid, and by the way, the kids do have to do work. They have to do legitimate work for you to pay them. And you can't just, you know, can't just. Is that, that is that, that is that literally, or is that? Uh... <laughs> you want to put your kids to work. They need a work ethic. Uh, but no, you you have to have a you have to have a federal identification number and an employer number with an uh, employee withholding number, state withholding number, um, a state unemployment um, number. So you have to file for those numbers and, and you have to have a company, an LLC or a sub S or a C Corp. And then, then you're able to cut your kids some, you know, some salaries and then Take them away and put them invested with them because they don't know what they don't know what they're doing anyway. Uh, very much outstanding, sir. Okay, so um, so that uh, as time is prolonging, um, this would be the last question that we're gonna ask um, uh, our expert, uh, Mr. Terry. Uh, yes, uh, the question is, uh, what is the procedure for small businesses to apply for grant? And I think we kind of covered that a little bit. I, yeah, well, I, can I, I think that was just a little bit more religious setting a, that we covered. Right. From a small business perspective, um, one of the best sources there is out there um, that the government does quite well is called the Small Business Administration, the SBA. Mm. And the SBA, actually, you go on their website, it will walk you through exactly what you've got to do to start your business. Right. It gives mm. you a big old checklist. So it walks you through and then it it walks you through how to submit for loans. And so mm. an SBA for a small business is a great resource um, to look at funding um, for for small businesses. Um, um, for grants, um, grants are more um from the small business standpoint, uh, minorities and women owned uh, businesses can apply for special federal grants. Mm. Uh, so if you're a, if you're a minority or you're uh, a female, you have those uh, options available to you for additional grants from, from the government as well. So those are, those are a couple ideas to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And I hope to all the viewers in the house, uh, wherever you are, let's go ahead and give uh, Mr. Terry a round of applause for the very much outstanding of uh, wealth of knowledge that I've been disseminated to us this evening. And we're definitely grateful, sir, uh, to all our viewers out there, if uh, your friends, your family that you know of, um, if they have not watched or they have not been able to get educated regarding how to make your money or how tax, how to work, how to make the tax rule actually work to you in a positive benefit please sub uh, tell them to come and watch this um this segment uh that was provided to you by the ccc usa youth national Diocese. and as we all know we started this program with the lord uh let us bow our heads down and conclude this prayer with the lord also jehovah jesus christ holy michael our Lord and our Savior, we thank you. We give you, we give you, uh, we give you glory for preserving us, for giving us the opportunity for us to be able to learn from your vessel that you have used today, Mr. Terry. And thank you, Mr. Terry, for the for the for, for his life, for the preservation of soul of his family, as he has done this. May the Lord continue to enlarge your coast in the mighty name of Jesus. And those that we have heard, Father Lord Jesus, the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. For us to apply this wisdom, for us to apply this knowledge in an accurate manner, O Lord, Father Lord, instill it into us in the mighty name of Jesus. Continue to be with us, continue to be our rock, continue to be our protector, so that all glorification can be given back unto you in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us as we go to our beds as people awake. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, let your goodness, mercy, and favor follow us all the days of our life. In the mighty name of Jesus, I have prayed. Seven, hallelujah, to praise God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, before we let Mr. Terry go, Mr. Terry, can you please come online and introduce yourself one more time to all our viewers all over the world, sir? Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Terry Smith, and I'm a certified public accountant in South Carolina, and I'm only licensed in South Carolina. So I uh, just want you just have to put that there. Uh. I'm only licensed in South Carolina. So just just if you're in South Carolina, let's talk. Um, but I'd love thank you so much, Shepherd of Christ and, and Kareem for inviting me and having me here. It's been a blessing. Thank you for your prayers. And uh, I also pray for you and, and your group that uh, that you will uh, shine Christ in the world uh, this year and do the right thing and save as much taxes as you can to give to the Lord even more. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you uh, to all the viewers in the, uh, in the world. Good night. Good morning. Good afternoon. As a blessed day, may the Lord be with all of us. Thank you very much, and you guys enjoy your day or night.